Hey there, and thanks for watching. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to walk you through my student housing acquisition model. So this student housing acquisition model is an adaptation of my value add apartment acquisition model. And so if you're familiar with that model, this one will be really easy. In fact, you really don't even need to watch this video. If you're new to either ACRE models or to either my value add apartment acquisition model, or certainly to this student housing acquisition model, you're going to find some value in this video. With all that said, I created a lengthy collection of tutorial videos for my value add apartment acquisition model. And those tutorials will be relevant to this model. And so in the uh, blog post where I share this model, I'll include a link to, to view that collection of tutorials. This video will serve to fill in the gaps, if you will, show what's different about this model compared to my value add apartment acquisition model. Now, the first tab you're going to see when you open the model is the versions tab. Again, if you've used an ACRE model, this will be a familiar tab to you. If you haven't, this is where we show any change that's happened to the model since its original release. This video is made upon the release of this original model. I'm not calling this a beta version simply because uh, the, the base of this model is my value add apartment acquisition model, and that has gone through dozens of updates used by tens of thousands of people. And so uh, certainly the, the primary functionality of this model should be sound. You undoubtedly, though, will find bugs. And so when you do, please let me know, and I'll include those in um, uh, further uh, or, uh, or new versions of the model. So beyond that, you're going to see a summary tab. Here the summary tab is uh, just what it says. It's a summary of your underwriting. You'll find that there are few inputs other than dropping in strengths and weaknesses of the deal. Uh, you're going to find some charts down below, uh, two charts that are distinct or specific to our student housing, which is call it a, a chart that, that visualizes the value add, kind of the value in place versus stabilize in its sale, as well as a, the mix of units that, that we have uh, in, in the asset. You're also going to see a reference to beds rather than units. I also drop in units, though, uh, here. And so in student housing, purpose-built, privately owned student housing generally rents by the bed, and so most of our metrics are tracked per bed. But we also look at, at per units, um, and so you'll see that scattered throughout the model. Now, the, the bulk of your underwriting will be done on the underwriting tab. Blue font cells are your input cells. You should expect to change every single cell that is blue in this model. So any placeholder value that you see that's blue, that's a, the expectation is that you're going to change it for your specific situation. Top, of course, investment description. Uh, really, the only changes are around beds versus units. Otherwise, it's largely the same. Uh, investment cash flow section is exactly the same, again, other than we're referring to uh, beds. Now, the model, because I added, I have both beds and, and units in some sections, I had to add a column within the model. And so you're going to find that this left-hand side where we enter our inputs that ultimately drive the cash flows out to the right is slightly wider. That actually necessitated me updating uh, eight different macros um, to accommodate the additional column. And so a lot of the changes in this model are actually on the back end that you won't ever see, but related to macros like add uh, a acquisition cost item or delete, add hard costs, add soft costs, and so forth. Uh, sources and uses are going to be the same other than uh, reviewing the amounts on a per bed basis. And then we get into operating uh, cash flow section. Again, largely the same. Now there's a, f a few differences. The first, of course, is we have units now as well as beds. All of your metrics on are, are on a per bed basis. Uh, updated the macros in order to accommodate that. Also though, in our value add apartment acquisition model, the assumption is that every month you're turning over units, you're releasing those units at market rent, you have some, um, uh, call it lag in growth in, in rent because you have units that are, are year out, but also that's then updating every single month. In student, 
you're generally going to have one, you're, you're going to have a leasing season and then all of your units are turned over and delivered in the span of, of a week or two. And so how we have now have this input where you choose the month at which all leases start. And that's when all leases will roll to market. Uh, by default, I have it as September, but you can really choose any month throughout the year when you're assuming all leases are going to start then. And so basically, um, your rent is flat and then September happens and you have some bump, assuming market rent goes up or some decrease if market rent goes down, but it, it, it's like a plateau. It, it immediately spikes up to the next plateau and moves forward rather than a gradual increase or decrease in rent based on rolling leases uh, in each month. So that's a, call it a backend functionality that's changed. The front end, what you see is this input lease start month. The other thing, I removed the option to adjust your lease term length. I assume all leases are 12 months. Um, you may have an 11 month lease. I get that uh, with call it one month of downtime. The assumption though, is that you have 12 months of, of revenue. Um, in a future version, if I, if I hear, hear that need to modify, say for a nine or a 10 um, or 11 month lease, uh, we can do that. But right now the assumption is that you have a 12 month lease, all of those leases sign and begin in some month of the year, in this case, by default, September. Uh, other than that, the inputs are going to be the same, uh, just on a per bed rather than a per unit basis, moving down into reversion, uh, cash flow or the reversion sale cash flows are identical to the value add apartment acquisition model. Same with your returns. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the model, you're going to find that you have the option to model your operating expenses on a detailed versus a basic. So if you click this detailed, what it does is it opens a new worksheet called detail expenses. And here you can detail out all of your expenses line by line, hundreds of lines in order to uh, really dig into your expense line items. I also have a detailed operating history going back up to five periods. And so by default, T12 plus previous year and the year prior to that, year prior to that, year prior to that, you might have though a T12 and a T3 and a T1 annualized. Um, up to you how you might use this. This is a good way where you can compare, say you're in place and you're stabilized versus previous years. So that's your detail expenses. Now you can go back to basic simply by click clicking that basic button and that will revert back to uh, again, basic, um, or in other words, not using your detailed like so. So I go to detailed and I come back and I go back to basic. Uh, and then again, reversion cash flow is the same. Otherwise the model is the same as our value add apartment acquisition model. As I said, I'll, I'll include a link so that you can access those tutorials as well. And together with this video and those tutorials, you should be able to uh, make good use, use of this model. Again, if you have any questions or if you, you catch any bugs or when you do, please let me know. Otherwise, thanks for your time.